For the last couple of weeks, we've been camping out, looking at John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, because there's so much in it. And so, to become reacquainted with it, let's just read this magnificent opening of the Gospel of John one more time. It says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made. Last week, we looked at these scriptures in the light of how Jesus is the expression of God. That a word is basically a thought communicated. You know, we, in order to express ourselves, we have to use words or people will just not really understand where we're coming from or what we mean. We have to use words. Those words come from our minds, correct? A word is a thought manifested, and John is saying that Jesus is the eternal word. Jesus is the physical manifestation of God's thoughts. Everything God could ever think and want to express to mankind is in the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus himself said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And guys, remember that in these opening three verses, John is very intentionally paralleling these verses with the creation story from Genesis chapter 1 verses 1 through 3, where there it says in the beginning, and right here it says in the beginning. Remember in that count in Genesis, God said, let there be light. He spoke, let there be light, and there was light. And now here in our text today, of course, John is also going to mention light. I want to read our text that we're gonna cover this morning. It's gonna be verses four through 13. And it says, in him was life and the life was the light of men and the light shines in the darkness and the darkness did not comprehend it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. This man came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all through him might believe. He was not that light but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light which gives light to every man coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So let's go back up as we dissect these verses. Verse four says, in him, Christ, in Christ was life, and the life was the light of man. And so as John continues to talk about what he knows about Jesus. Remember, this is a guy who said, I've touched him, I've handled him, I walked with him, I was one of the 12. And Genesis chapter one says this about God, but I actually was there. This is what I have to tell you about God. And I really understand it, I know. My name is John the Apostle, and I want you to know that as God expresses himself, through Jesus Christ, it comes through life and light. And this is interesting because knowing Jesus as life and light changes your entire relationship to God. We understand that life comes from Christ and light comes from Christ. It, it, it changes everything. This thing we call life, this mystery, comes from him. Everybody has contemplated the mystery of life, and it is a mystery because you just wake up one morning and you have these thoughts like, I just am, and I think, and wow, and stuff is real, and stuff grows, and life, here we are. It's not like some dream, it's really happening. And it all comes from him, which means every single one of us owes our life to him. Without him, none of us would have ever lived. Without him, we wouldn't have air to breathe. We wouldn't have dirt to stand on. We wouldn't have a vocal box to be able to laugh. But the difference in the life that Jesus has that we don't have 
is that our life dies. We've just got some life for, you know, 80 years, but Jesus is life. You and I can only say, I have life. Jesus says, I am life. He is the source of life. And within that life is also light. Look at verse 5. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Look at the word comprehend. That word, more correctly translated, would be the word extinguish or overcome. So it would say the darkness cannot extinguish light. The darkness cannot overcome light. And this is true. The darkness has not and will not ever be able to overcome the light of Jesus Christ. You know, you can walk into a pitch black room with a baseball bat and try to beat the darkness out of the room all you want. Or you can just flip the light switch. And when the lights come on, darkness doesn't have a counterattack, does it? It's like when you turn the lights on, it's not like darkness can give a, a nice left cross like in retaliation. No, it, it, it just goes away. It hasn't a chance. It's just a simple principle of science. When you turn the lights on, darkness is, it's just gone. It doesn't even put up a fight. It can't. Darkness cannot coexist with light. You can't have some darkness and some light. It, it just doesn't work that way. It immediately vanishes. And this must be really frustrating for Satan and his demons. You know, they try to snuff the light and it just keeps coming back. It's like when you were a little kid, did anyone ever pull the prank on you with un unblowable candles? Do you remember those things? When I was a little kid, they were a hit. I don't even know if you can, I haven't seen them in a while, but it was like the thing. Like you didn't have a party unless your mama brought you some unblowable candles. You know what I mean? And you see the kid like, and they're trying and trying and everyone's like, ah, laughing. And, oh, Johnny can't blow the candles out. And anyways, flashback to my childhood. That's what I picture the devil doing. You know, he's like, he's trying to blow it out, and just when he thinks it's out, it comes up. I mean, we're not the only church, even in a close area, that's meeting right now. There's churches everywhere. There's churches everywhere in California. There's churches everywhere in the United States. There's churches all over the world, and the enemy has tried to kill us. They've tried to stop us. They've tried to legislate to where we can't say what we need to say, and we're here because darkness cannot extinguish the light. Amen? Amen. Verses six through eight talks about a person who was sent to really manifest and promote the light. And it says, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. This man came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. John the Apostle briefly introduces another John, John the Baptist. And later on in chapter one, John the Baptist is spoken of more. And so I'm not gonna really talk about him this morning. I can't wait to dig into him later, but for today, the only thing I'm gonna say is that because John was such an anointed prophet of God, I mean, the historian Josephus said that over 250,000 people flocked to the wilderness to see John and be baptized by him. They're east of Jericho, which would locate, be located today on the Israeli-Jordanian border just north of the Dead Sea. Right there, people flocked to that area to see this man. And so many people at that time wondered if John was the light. But he says, I'm not the light. I'm, I'm just pointing you to the light. He was just come to bear witness of the light that people might believe in the true light. And guys, really, that's what my aim is today. I want to dig into all the dynamics of light and what that means for us. And I don't just want to look at it like, okay, we're kind of looking at it from a distance. But as I said before, your relationship to light shapes everything about your relationship to God. And so I want to read verses 9 through 11, 
and then we're going to have a conversation about the light of Christ. Look at these verses. Verse 9. That was the true light which gives light to every man coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. So in verse 9, it says Jesus is the true light. And, and what this means is his light is spiritual truth. You know, his light is reality. For some of you, think of the things you thought of before you were saved. I mean, before God's reality came into you, I mean, you think about the things you gravitated towards and you're like, I was just a nuthead. Like, what was I thinking? Like, my thoughts were so jaded. Well, when you're saying Jesus is light, it's saying, it's talking about reality, spiritual truth. And verse nine says he gives this light to everyone. 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 Really? Everyone? Yeah. God manifests his light to every single person who's ever born. People have to be taught atheism. You have to be convinced by other atheists that atheism is real. Because when human beings are left without modern teachings and they're left without biblical knowledge, their instincts let them know there's a God who created everything. You take away modern teaching and biblical teaching and you go to the jungles. Do you know what the social reports are? People tend to believe there's something out there. There's even people who have never been taught there's a hell and they're scared they're going to go there after they die. There's so many books written about it. It's pretty common knowledge, actually. You also have to be taught that morals are not absolute. The Bible says that the law is written upon our hearts. God has not only given us a witness of himself when we look up, as Psalm 19 says, the heavens declare the glory of God. Day after day, the creation utters forth speech to humankind. He's not only left the testimony outside of us, but he's also left the testimony in us. Because there's not a person in the world who doesn't instinctively know murder is wrong. If I take life, it's wrong. They know that. You even go to these villages in third world countries where murder might be a little more prevalent. And you'll get these guys confessing, saying, yeah, I murdered, but I was scared to death to do it. Well, why were you scared? Because I knew it was wrong. And I know there might be a consequence because of what I do. Everybody instinctively around the world knows you probably shouldn't mess with another man's wife. You know, there are certain truths that everybody knows. It's not because we were born and raised in America. It has nothing to do with that. It's because God has left a witness of himself in us. He is a light that shines on everybody. Everybody. So then, Josh, how come so many people don't see it? How come people don't want it? I mean, light, we think, would be good. I mean, never in a movie is light considered dark. You know, even Hollywood understands light is good. So when the true light is there, why do people not want it? The Apostle Paul, I believe, answers this question very well. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3-4, through 4, even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age the devil has blinded who do not believe lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. The light is there, but they're blinded. They don't believe. And what I want you guys to understand is that for thousands of years, mankind has continually ran away from the light. The world is so bad that when the light showed up, they sentenced the light to the worst death mankind has ever imagined. Let's sentence the light to the cross. That's how jacked up we are without God in our lives. The world didn't really want it. The world wanted for the lights to be kept turned off. Verse 10 says, 
He was in the world. This speaks of how Jesus stepped into the world. The world was made through him, and yet the world did not know him. When Jesus came into the world, the world didn't know him. Now, this is not talking about the entire cosmos. It's not talking about how nothing knew him. It's specifically talking about mankind because it seems like everything else in his creation understood who he was except human beings. Nature knew who he was. The wind and the waves knew who he was. When he spoke to them, they immediately obeyed. They got it. They understood. The rocks knew who he was. A simple rock is smart enough to know who he is. Remember when he came riding on the donkey into Jerusalem, the triumphal entry? We call it Palm Sunday. The Pharisees are tripping. Dude, don't let these people worship you. Tell them to stop. And Jesus says, I tell you the truth. If these people don't worship me, even these rocks are going to cry out. The rocks even understand who he is. Animals know who he is. At a silent prayer, fish immediately swam and jumped into a net. When Jesus rode that donkey on Palm Sunday, the Bible text tells us that donkey had never been ridden. Even a donkey <laughs> knew who was riding on top of him and submitted, and he even got it. Demon-possessed people fell at his feet and said, we know who you are. Even dead people understood who he was. And when he spoke to them, they arose. So the word world in verse 10 is really talking about humanity. He came into humanity and humanity was made through him and yet humanity did not know him. It's like, have you ever seen the movie Tron? Like if you're a little geeky, you've probably seen Tron. It's that movie about how the computer designer, like there's this brilliant genius computer designer and he, he finds out this way to like go inside the computer program. I know you later are like, ah, yeah, I've never seen that. Well, probably if you're a guy you have, maybe more so. Anyways, when he gets into the computer program, the design knows who the designer is. Like he's walking around in a body and like everything in the program is like, we know who the maker is. But yet here it says the world didn't know Jesus. Why didn't the world recognize Jesus? Why didn't the world recognize its maker? Have you ever thought about that? Do you understand why even still today, people in the world don't recognize him? John is saying that it has to do with man's darkness. That mankind doesn't like the light. Well, they might say they like the light, but they really don't like the light. And guys, what I want to do for the rest of our time today is I want to talk to you guys about light. And again, it's uh, more so about our relationship to light because how you respond to light reveals everything about who you are as you sit in your chair today. Do you know that? How you've responded to light in your life determines how you dress right now. It determines uh, where you're at in life. It, de it determines your thought patterns. It determines what you're into. It determines what you say. It determines what you did over the weekend. It, it all I mean, light comes. You just have the choice to decide how you're going to deal with it. And so if you're taking notes, if you have a pen or a pencil handy, I want to give you three things about light as it deals with your relationship to it. Three things about light. Three things that, for me at least, when I was meditating, praying, thinking on these, these were very powerful to me. The first thing about light is that it makes sin not fun. Light makes sin not fun. Sin is easier to commit at nighttime 
Sin is more pleasurable when the lights are turned off. Think about it. This is very practical. You have two 18-year-olds, and they see each other in the hallways, and they start flirting and whatever, and they see each other at a party, and they're getting closer, and they start dating. They start making out, and they have these desires where they want to go further, and all of a sudden, there's a weekend, and her parents are gone, and so she's like, let's go to my house, and so they're about to have sex for the first time, and all of a sudden, they both reach for the light switch. Why? Why can't they keep the light turned on? Because light makes sin, not fun. They got to turn the light switch off in order to do the sinful act that they want to do. Does that make sense? Let's say you have a scenario where you got this girl and she starts getting into the club scene. She likes going to the club, so she's dancing. She's like, uh, 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 you know? (laughs) And yeah, I did it, okay. Once in a lifetime. <laughs> so she's doing her thing, and all of a sudden, this guy starts giving her all of his, you know, his attention. And he's like speaking sweet nothings into her ear, being all smooth, and buying her drinks and everything like that. And she's just totally captured by this guy. And so he gets her number, and she goes back to her apartment with all her friends, and she's like, I I can't tell you the guy. I danced with the hottest guy at the club. He's the most amazing guy. I can't wait for you girls to see him. And so she's like, you know, when he calls a couple days later, come over, I want you to meet my roommate. So they're all excited. They're like, you know, doing their girl thing that we know you guys do sometimes. And so he comes over, and now that she can see him in the light, Dang, you looked a lot better at the club. (laughs) Now she doesn't want anything to do with him, and now she's all embarrassed because her friends are like, must have been a down night at the club, huh? Like, (laughs) what's going on? Why is it that bars are always dark? I've been in plenty of them in my past. Never been to a bar where the lights are on, No, to be comfortable in that scene, you have to turn the lights off. Most murders take place in the dark. The majority of sin is committed at nighttime instead of the day. That's why it says we're children of the day. Married couples don't need to turn the light off. There's nothing defiled about that. Married couples can be intimate and be in God's presence and enjoy it how God wanted it to be fulfilled. And there's people out there that are so addicted to sex and they've never once experienced it the way God intended it to be. And they'll die never knowing that the thing they thought was the greatest thing in life, they didn't even get to enjoy it in its fullness. Light takes the fun out of sin. That's the first thing about it. Secondly, the second thing I was thinking of about light is that light shows us what's gross. Light shows us what's really gross. Light isn't always easy to deal with because when light shines on the darkness, that which is gross and that which is always gross can actually be seen and recognized as gross. It's like imagine if you all woke up this morning and never looked in the mirror and never turned the light on and then you came to church. (laughs) Light helps, right? As long as the lights are turned off, you can't actually see how gross it is. And it made me think of a, the example was a drug dealer's house. And it's like, don't ask why I thought of that. You're probably like, this. You're so weird. Like, it's just what came into my mind. Because in all the drug dealers' houses that I went to, all of them were so disgusting. I I don't know what it is about these guys. You go to a drug dealer's house, and it's like, there has to be, like, stains in the toilet. The dishes have to be piled high, and they're, like, munching on food from a fork that they've been munching on for, like, a couple weeks. And it's just gross. The carpets are sick. 
you know, there's like burn marks all over the car, all over the couch, and the carpet has stuff smeared in it, and, it, and it's just nasty. Drug dealers' houses are always dark, by the way. It's probably like a p- paranoia problem where like they're all skittish and sketched out, so they're like, they feel more comfortable in the dark. So when a normal person finally makes it over to the house, they're saying, this is so sick. Can't you smell this? What is wrong with you? Dust, clean, pick up whatever. And, and they're like, this is absolutely disgusting. And then the drug dealers are just like, whatever. You know, they don't care. But then the normal person opens up the curtains and let the light in. And then even the drug dealer looks around and is like, oh, dang, this is really gross. <laughs> shut the blinds so I don't have to be so grossed out by my carpet. I lay on this thing, you know. Do you understand the principle? Do you understand what I'm saying? Light shows what things really look like. And when that's happening, people don't want to deal with it. So what does a person do who doesn't want to deal with it? They'll stay in darkness and they'll put their head down because they can't look up at the light, so they'll look down. They won't look people in the eye. Jesus said if your eye is full of darkness, it means your whole body's full of darkness. So they'll keep their head down, and they'll stay in darkness. It's like, man, things were okay till you open up the curtains and let some light shine on me. Now I gotta face, like, the reality of what's going on in my life. So that's why people get uncomfortable when you drop a huge bomb called Jesus in their life. It's like a light bomb went off, and they're just like, ah! And they just got to run. They don't know what to do with it. Makes them, it's like, ah! And as long as you live your life hiding from light, you live a lie. And then you'll have all these other people who care about you, who are trying to talk to you about your life, but you won't have any of it because darkness keeps you from seeing how gross and how unhealthy your life really is. So when it says in verse 9 that the light gives light to every man, it doesn't mean that everyone's going to respond to that light because facing the light means you're going to have to face yourself Honestly, and some people have a serious problem facing the truth about themselves. It's kind of a prerequisite for you to get saved, right? I mean, think of when you got saved, you had to come to the reality about yourself. And that light gave you truth, and the truth set you free. Even the most mature Christians, you know, even people that are really walking with the Lord and they're spirit-filled, there's even moments, aren't there? If you're married, you know, because you have someone living with you, sleeping in your same bed, who sees you better than anyone else. They know. And so there might be an issue in your life and they bring it up and you're just like, yeah, I don't want to deal with it. You know, we still struggle, don't we, sometimes with our weaknesses? It's like, don't, don't tell me about that because it makes me feel gross and I think I'm doing pretty good. But Jesus, man, Jesus is a clean freak. He is. It's like if he walked in this room, he'd be looking in the corners like, like I see there's a cobweb right up there. Jesus would notice that. As he's looking in the chambers of your heart and soul, yeah, he sees there's light. He's all good with it. But he's like, man, I want you to have more light. I, 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 I want you to be full of light. And so he keeps doing that to us, doesn't he? He keeps doing it. And as he does, light reveals what's really gross in our life. The third thing about light, I've mentioned that light makes sin not fun. Light shows you what's gross. Thirdly, now, light is offensive. Light is very offensive. I mean, why are people so uptight about Jesus anyways? What did he ever do? What is it about him that upsets people? And yet people hate 
the thought of Jesus being God and the only God and the only way to the Father. Why? Why does that message trip people out? Is it because he healed so many people? Is it because he forgave and loved his enemies? Do they hate him because of the way he treats people? Is it because he helped the poor? Is it because he dealt a certain way with government? Is it because he treated people equally? Is it because he changed how men are to respect and treat women? Is it because he's honest and fair and altogether humble? But yet you bring up his name and people trip out. People don't like it at all. Try it tomorrow. Try it tomorrow at work or around your friends and say, I just want to ask you guys one question. Something I've just been thinking about. And they say, okay, what? And say, if the implications, no, say it this way. Say, if everything Jesus said about himself is true, what are the implications for your life? And they'll be like, peace out, dude. <laughs> like, what are you talking about, you weirdo, you freak? And they just don't like it. Let me give you an example. H have you ever been in a deep sleep, like hibernation kind of deep sleep, and you're woken up by sudden light? Isn't that the worst? Maybe not for some of you. For me, it's, it's like, I'm glad you guys never get to see how I wake up. I'm glad you don't know that about me. My, life, my, my, my wife learned the hard way. Uh, seriously, true story. We were newly married, and I'm in like this, I sleep deep, okay? If Hulk and Thor got in a fist fight in my bedroom, I'd sleep. I would just, psh, it takes a lot to wake me up. And so I'm sleeping, and all of a sudden she comes into the room and puts the lights on, and she says, honey, I made you breakfast. And I go, ah, turn the light off. And I like shrivel up in fetal position and like <laughs> put covers, stop. She's like, what is wrong with you? Turn the lights off. And I'm grumpy and grouchy. And she's like, you freak. I got breakfast for you. I don't, turn the light off. She's learned. It's like now when she wakes me up, she'll just kind of be like, hey, Josh. <laughs> hey, Joshy. Joshy, boo. <laughs> I made you breakfast. And I'm like, mm. <laughs> <laughs> what was I saying? Abrupt, bright light makes people in darkness really upset. But check this out, guys. Check this out. People who want to refuse Christ's light have to come up with an explanation for life and light and darkness. Does that make sense? We all experience life and light and darkness. So if we won't let the Bible teach us about reality, we have to make something else up. And mankind has invented and come up with all sorts of crazy ideas. But here's the truth. All religions and all philosophies that don't contain the truth of Christ have been thought up and invented in a dark black hole where there is no light. And when the light shines, because the light is so bright, it creates a hatred towards the light from those who like to live in the dark black hole. That's why the Pharisees hated Jesus so much. Because he shed light on their dark religious system where they were like the cool kids and the rich kids because they were called Pharisees and priests. And Jesus shed light on them and they crucified him. That's why scholarly atheists hate Christians. And when you try to talk to them and get in a dialogue and when you kind of corner them, they get very, very angry because they like their dark little hole that makes sense to their own reasoning. It's all blackened. And when you shed some truth on that, they really, really don't like that. Nevertheless, people still have to deal with his light every single day. 
Because even if they're opposed to Jesus, guess what? Jesus isn't opposed to them. And so he keeps trying. He continues to pursue and he continues to expose himself to people because he has a love that's different from human love. Light always tries to find a way. Isn't that interesting? If there's just like a tiny little crease, light will find its way through to the other side. That's what Jesus does. Aren't you glad the light kept on trying to get through to you when you were avoiding it and running away from it? He found that one little weak point and he kept hitting on that point. That one little soft spot and he kept hitting there till a ray of light could shine through. And then when you just let that little ray of light shine through and you realized how good it was, when you tasted how sweet he was, then you let him melt the rest of the hardness. Aren't you glad he kept searching after you? That when you told him no once, when you told him no 10 times, he kept trying? Light just keeps coming. Light is pretty relentless. I love that about Jesus. Some of you hated the thought of God at one point. I'm just curious, if, if you were kind of hostile or if, if the thought of God just kind of made you upset or you didn't like it, raise your hand if that was some of you in this room. Yeah. It's like you guys couldn't stand the gospel. You know, you'd see a Christian and you'd just be like, I want to punch this guy because he's so stupid. I hate Christians. And why? Because you were dumb and because you weren't thinking right? No, it was because your heart and your mind were full of black darkness. You were like Smeagol off in your own little cave, you know? Loving with nobody messing with you. And even now for all of us, we all still have to deal with his light every single day. And so what I want to say, and this might apply to some of you, is, is that you can't control the light. I, I think there's some people where they're like, yeah, I, I like Jesus and I'm a Christian, I want to go to heaven, but I want to take that flashlight and I want it to have different settings. And when I want the setting to be low, it'll be on low. When I want to turn it up, I'll turn it up. Jesus doesn't work that way. And I think sometimes people have this mindset. But you're, you know, where are you at? Are, are you able to face the light every day or is that just a little too intense for you? Because his flashlight only has one setting, intense. God's intense. I mean, when I first met God, it was amazing. I mean, light is intense. After church, you just try to look at the sunlight for a little bit. And you can't do it for very long. And he's the source of that. He's greater than that. God is intense. I, I just don't relate with people at all when they say, well, God, I, I, I haven't really ever felt him. It's like, I've felt him. He's intense. His light is powerful. And so does the idea of being touched and exposed by his light kind of freak you out? Because I think there can be people who say they believe in Jesus, but you choose to live at the edge of darkness and you even flirt with the darkness all the time. Sometimes you even cross over and you make out with the darkness. My message is that you can't call Jesus your savior, but then say, don't let too much of your light fill my life because I don't want you to mess with my reputation. I, want you, I don't want you to mess with my status or my scene. I want you there, but I want you there as long as I can kind of control my exposure to the light, and it just doesn't work that way. Friends, when light hits your life and it reveals the truth about who you are, it can be offensive. It can be at times. But God isn't going to tell you everything you want to hear He's not going to approve everything you want to represent. So what's Christ's agenda in all of this anyways? It's like, seriously, what's up, man? You make sin not fun. You make me realize how gross I am in my heart. And I'm sometimes offended at your confrontations. What's up? On his end, why does he do that? Why does he do that? What's his agenda? I think it's simple. 
you can't help a person until they see themselves in an honest way. You get that, right? There's no help for a person who can't admit what their problem is. And so Jesus doesn't do it to make you feel like a loser. He wants to build you up. He wants to heal you. He shines light ultimately in order to heal us. Because when the light shines, we're able to see the truth. And what did Jesus say about truth? The truth shall set you free. There's freedom when God exposes his light on us. There's no healing. There's no change in your life. There's no transformation in your life without the truth of light. And sometimes that offense, when it comes to us, it hurts a little bit. But the hurt is worth going through. It's like some of you, at least one of you, woke up this morning and you had a nasty pimple somewhere on your face. It deeply offended you. It grossed you out. You could have chosen to ignore that rotten offense on your face. But you didn't. You chose to acknowledge it, and you dealt with the pain. <laughs> and dealing with the pain has made you better, and you feel a lot better now, now that people can see your face. So yes, you can make a spiritual analogy out of a zit. I just did, I think. <laughs> Christ is going to build you up, but his truth is going to offend you. It's like, I dare you to do something tonight. Tonight before you go to bed, read in your Bible anywhere. It doesn't matter where. Genesis to Revelation, pick a book, read for 30 minutes. And every single one of you within that 30 minutes is going to be confronted by God. Do you know what I'm talking about? I mean, you're going to be built up. You're going to see spiritual truth. But you're going to read, and all of a sudden, because the Bible is like a mirror, it's going to show you your own life, and you're going to see something, and you're going to say, gross. Ah, I'm kind of, ah I don't like that. He's going to confront you. And he's not afraid to do it. Because that's the way, that's his process of getting you to a place where it's dealt with and you're healed and you have joy and you have peace and, and, and all those types of things. So as the light keeps hitting you, it reorientates you to all of the issues of life. That's why when you get saved, you all of a sudden start thinking differently. And some things you think differently about right away. Some, for some things, it takes like three years. Three years. I had a gentleman after first service come up to me today and he said, do you remember that conversation we had a few years ago? And I said, yeah, I do remember because I was talking to him about a sin in his life. And he said, you know what? I appreciated that conversation, but I never really understood it. And he said, today I understood it. Thank you. So you just keep light hitting and it's gonna reorientate you to all the issues of life. For me, Instead of marijuana giving me pleasure, now I'm filled with the Holy Spirit. You know, he's he's retaught me how to live. God reorientates your sexual life. He gives you a true and healthy knowledge about sexuality. And light means that Jesus isn't just what you want him to be. Light means you believe exactly what he said about himself and you begin to see life through his eyes. So guys, before anything at all, before anything, if you, if you have ever wondered, Josh, why do you do what you do? It, 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 here it is. I want people to be exposed to the light of Jesus Christ. I am, I'm not trying to get people to come to this church. That's not my thing. I want people to be exposed to the light of Jesus Christ. That's what I want because I have a great hero to follow, verses six through eight, in John the Baptist, who was a pointer and he pointed people to the light. And that's a great person for me to try to follow. That's what I want to do. I'm not here to please men. You can't steer me. You can't get me to do something unless it's in the word of God. You just can't. 
I want to please God. When I die, I really want him to look me in the eyes and say, well done, good and faithful servant. That's who I ultimately care about his opinion of me. That's, who, that's what I care about. And so I want all kinds of people to come in here. Yeah, I, I want believers to come in here, but I want sinners to come in here. I, 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 I want homosexuals to come in here. I want them to be hugged, and I want them to be loved. I want drug addicts to come in here. I want, I want every type of person to come in here, and I want them to be loved, but I also want them to know the light of Jesus Christ is gonna hit you here and you're gonna have to deal with it. And you might leave here very frustrated and angry and you might pick another church who says what you wanna hear, but it's not gonna be what the Bible has to say. Amen. And so we all have to deal with light. I still have to deal with light. You know, it's, it's, it hits me every day and we have to react to it. We have to respond to it. And so I want to be that person who keeps letting the light hit me. I don't want to be offended by the light. When it hits me, I might say, oh, that's on my face? Okay, get rid of it. I'm not going to pretend like it's not there, Jesus. I'm not going to pretend like you didn't say that to my heart and choose to ignore it. I'm going to face it, and I, I want it to come out. We should all be like moths to a porch light. You know, just like so drawn to the light. Just in love with the light, in love with Jesus. His light is the cross. His light is the Bible. I don't want to be like the people in verses 10 through 11. I want to be, I want this church to be like the people in verses 12 and 13. And these are our final verses. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become the children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Verse 12 starts by saying, but, but, in contrast to the people in verses 10 through 11, but, that's where you and I come in to as many as have received him. He gives us the right to become children of God. It says that being a children of God is a right. It's nothing we deserve. It's a right. It's a privilege. So when somebody says, well, we're all just the children of God, no, it's a right that's only given to those who believe on the name of Jesus Christ. It's not a biblical idea to say we are all God's children. Do you know what we all are without him? Ephesians chapter 2, verse 3 says, We all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath. That's what we are. The true children of God are those who receive Jesus, and when you receive him, verse 13 says, We were born, not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God, a person who is a child of God is one who is defined as being born of God. And then John tells us what this doesn't mean. It means we're not born of blood. It has nothing to do with that. It's not by physical genealogy. You know, God has no grandchildren. He only has children. It's not of the flesh. Being born of God is, is it's not something you can set your mind to do. You can accomplish many things in life through determination, but determination cannot produce a godly life. If you walk out of this building to say, today and say, I'm not going to walk in darkness anymore, you're going to fail. You might do good for a week, tops, and you're going to fail. It must be a spiritual work. It's a supernatural thing. It also says it can't be by the will of man, which means you can't make a person come into this new life by pushing or coercing them. No person can make someone else a believer. Nobody pushed you or forced you to be a Christian. Nobody did that to you, and you can't do it to anyone else. The new birth can only come from God. Think about it. You had nothing to do with your physical birth. It was totally passive on your part. 
You didn't get to pick who your parents were, what you look like, what hospital you were born, what era you were born into. And your spiritual birth is a passive experience. It happens by receiving Christ. That doesn't take much. Even a poor homeless man can lift up his hands and receive a piece of bread from somebody. And we have the ability to lift our heart up and receive Jesus. And when you receive Jesus, the new birth from God takes place in your heart. Now, for me, if this makes sense, if this makes sense, I believed in Jesus my whole life before I received Jesus. Does that make sense to you? Any one of you? I believed in Jesus, but I didn't know if I was going to heaven. I believed in God. I believed the Bible. There was no other book I would believe in. But although I believed in Jesus, it never affected me personally. When I really received Jesus, like I said, it was intense. It was up close and personal in my face. A relationship with God is experiential. It's not something where you're like, okay, where's the dotted line? I'll sign my name and I'm good, right? I'm ready to go. Okay, no, that's not it. Receiving Christ is to be born again. So, because I love you and because I care where you end up, I just want to throw this out there. You have believed in Jesus. Have you received Jesus? Because there is a difference. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 3 says, no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. What does that mean? Nobody, nobody, the Bible says it, nobody can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. This is what it means. Anybody can call him Savior. But can you call him Lord? Can you honestly and truly with the Holy Spirit saying, yes, 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 it's true for you, can you say, Jesus is my Lord? Because Lord means you've made yourself his servant. And a servant has relinquished his will. A servant has no rights. A servant doesn't dictate the course of his life anymore. The master does. Only by the Holy Spirit can you truly, honestly, look me or anyone else in the eyes and say, Jesus is my Lord. He is my master. Can you do that through the Holy Spirit? As we transition into worship, Light, it's a powerful thing. <laughs> wow. <laughs> that wasn't planned, I promise. <laughs> you know, it's there, it's everywhere this spiritual light, this reality. The physical light is just a reminder that the spiritual light really exists. How are you gonna respond today? That's my challenge to you. Because I can talk about it and I've, I've, I've meditated on it and yeah, I, I, I get it. Like light makes sin not fun. Light, it's, it makes me understand where I'm gross and you know, light sometimes is offensive. But I can't apply that to your life. You know, I don't know where you all live, the Holy Spirit does. I don't know what you did last night or this weekend, the Holy Spirit does. How are you gonna respond to light from here on out? Fellas, men, when you're alone in a room and the wife has gone to bed or people in your house are gone to bed, all of a sudden there's a TV program that you know you shouldn't watch, you know you shouldn't watch it because the light has already begun to descend upon the room. And when you're faced with the light, you understand? It's every day, it's every hour that you live, you're faced with light. How are you gonna respond to the light? Are you gonna push him away? Because when you push the light away, you're pushing Jesus away. How do you respond to light? When it shows up in your life. What is God speaking to you personally? Whatever it is, that's what you need to respond to today. I, I can't 
determine that for you. But whatever God's speaking to you, that's what you need to deal with. If there's something he needs to squeeze, let him just go through that process. You know? Let him deal with you. Because ultimately, like I said before, he wants to heal you. Also, if you're here today, and if you're not a Christian, or if you thought you were a Christian and maybe you're realizing today you're not, or if you were like me, if you can relate to where, you know, when I said I, I, I believed in Jesus but I hadn't received him, if, if that kind of makes sense to you, like if you're ready to receive Jesus Christ, do not walk out of this room today not having received him. Because the more you reject the light, the harder it is to face it when you're ready. It's like take the opportunity today. If God's kind of making your heart feel like you're not really right with him and you need to get right, take the opportunity. In a second, I'm gonna just ask you to slip up your hand. And it's basically just an acknowledgement from you saying, okay, I'm here, I'm ready. I wanna do this. If you haven't really given him all your sin, if you haven't let him take in it, if you haven't let him be your Lord and master, if you've kind of tried to determine how much light you're gonna let shine on you, he wants to blow you away and open the curtains, man. You know, he, he wants to come in. He wants to show you how intense and how awesome he is. That who he is really can replace the things you're scared of letting go. That's what he wants to do.